I'm a hospital doctor by background and been in clinical informatics for 15 years. And today I'm going to talk about the interurban fire curation work, which I'm leading on. So in terms of agenda, I'm going to talk about which are the use cases we used in, in, in the fire curation work, which is transfer of care, which is um, I, I kind of had a vested interest in making sure the transfer of care happened as a clinical aid, but also GP Connect, which we managed to get them in the loop. Um, I'll briefly talk, talk about what is fire curation. I think David has covered it and give you a lot of background and why do we need it within UK uh, and how we're we doing it. And I'll go through some examples to give you some flavor of uh, what curation means and what kind of design decisions we make. And that will lead to uh, next steps in summary. So what is transfer of care? Um, David slightly touched on transfer of care is an initiative set up within NHS Digital to make sure the patients get the best possible care when they move between the care professionals and care providers. So the diagram shows a um, lot of interactions. Our scope is limited to four use cases, mostly uh, the communications from secondary care to GPs in e-discharge summaries in patients in day case, uh, moving on to mental health discharge summary and emergency care discharge summary, and finally the outpatient letters. You might be aware that there is an NHS standard contract deadline uh, set up by NHS England by October 2018. All providers are expected to send uh, discharge summaries using structured messages um, and specifications of fire. So other program which we got in the loop was GP Connect, and GP Connect has been trying to unlock the information held in GP systems uh, for other settings. Uh, they already have a HTML version down, uh, which just allows you to look at the record. But the work we have done has led to development of another specification in which you have structured medication and structured allergies. So what is fire curation? Um, it is a clinical and technical process, an assurance process, where we map um, an information model, for example, allergies and adverse reactions, to a fire resource, as David described, like allergy intolerance. In that process, um, we have to make a lot of design decisions. We uh, discuss about the terminology bindings, whether they are SNOMED CT bindings or the value sets, and all those decisions about profiling to create a UK profile um, is uh, what we do in curation. So currently, we are doing STU3, which is standard and trial use version 3 of FHIR. And I think the biggest um, kind of value of curation is the group of subject matter experts we bring together, including clinicians, the technical modelers, the clinical terminologies, the clinical safety, the vendors. Uh, so this is the first time. I, I've been in clinical informatics 15 years. This is the first time we have all these experts in the same room or, or virtual room trying to solve these problems. Uh, and, and what we create is so something called a design decision matrix, which is what we call DDM, uh, which is a spreadsheet in which we record decisions, which I'll, I have a screenshot of that. So why do it? Um, because in a way, fire curation adds a bit of time. Uh, at the moment, we, we might take around three weeks to do a profile, uh, depending on how big that is but it actually makes the product fit for purpose. Um, it helps the suppliers who are implementing, the, who plan to implement the fire resources or APIs, um, and it also challenges the clinical information model. It doesn't matter how much consultation uh, we do, there is always a challenge when you come to practical implementation. The clinical information model might not be right. Uh, it creates a consistency of fire profiles, given NHS Digital has got um, 60, 70 plus programs. So if GP Connect, Transfer of Care, we have other programs, Digital Child Health, if all of them had their own teams doing fire profiles, it will not be consistent. So the, this central process gives that consistency to make sure uh, that we get consistent output for all programs. And the final point, which I made earlier that um, I have never in the last 15 years have a forum where all these subject matter experts have come together um, and at a single point to discuss uh, clinical informatics and to move the agenda forward. And it's really rewarding. And it's a, it's a education, but also it's a value add to the product when you've got all these SMEs and clinicians and technical modelers, as I said, and clinical safety together. So like any process, um, 
there is there are some key inputs um, to the process when we start, uh, when any program comes to us. And given um, we have started this process in November, it's not a kind of mature, it's kind of we've done it for five months. But we have a lot of demands. A lot of people are hitting us because everybody, all programs want to go through fire curation now. But we have found that if, some, if you have an information model or a spreadsheet, that not, might not be just enough to do curation. There are a lot of other things we need to understand. We need to understand what your use case is, what your clinical workflow is, um, whether you have a clinically assured information model, idly assured by professional record standards body, which is PRSP. You have some patient journeys, because the idea of fire curation process is engagement. It's engagement with suppliers and engagement with real clinicians. And if you're going to engage with real clinicians, we need patient journey with real example clinical content where they, where they, where they can think about that there's a discharge summary and the patient being discharged and is allergic to penicillin, and all that content is there to give them a bit more context of how that will fit in fire. We want to look at the technical architecture overview, um, initial list of fire resources, idly, but we have technical modelers in our team who can help you with that, and some kind of deployment approach, because at the end of the day, we want to create a product which is going to be deployed. Uh, like anybody else, we want to create a product which is sitting on a shelf. Um, list of engaged vendors is really important because vendor engagement is one of the biggest output uh, of fire curation, and we want vendors to be on the calls, which we have every Friday, to make sure they are happy with the product we are creating. And also first of type sites who are going to do the first of type testing uh, for the fire uh, specifications. So a bit about process, um, how does that work? As I said, the fire curation is all about taking an information model, which is allergies and adverse reaction in this example, in a use case, which is e-discharge summary in this example. And the first step is to create an initial map of the information model to a fire resource, which would be allergy intolerance. And the mapping is done by a core team which includes the clinician, as I said, the technical resources, the terminologies, and the clinical safety, and they meet every Monday. And they document that mapping in a spreadsheet. They all, we also document what our key assumptions are for doing that mapping, because that needs to be validated by the stakeholders in Interopen. And that is presented on, a, on, on the first Friday, which is called the introduction call, to the vendors and the clinicians to say, this is our initial proposal. But all, we also give them some key questions we want specific answers on, uh, so that uh, sometimes we want, we want to ask the vendors, if we sent you this code, would you be able to use it? Would you deprecate to text? All those questions asked to vendors so that we create a value set which is implementable by, by, by vendors. And then that leads to a phase two, which is a 10-day review period in which we leave the vendors and the community, inter-open community, with all the questions. Um, and they have time to think about those questions and come back with some answers in a spreadsheet where they can add their comments. And that leads a, another call a week after Friday, where it's, which is the approval call, where by then the core team has actually looked at, at the comments which the community has provided, and then we provide our proposals um, for the design decision to get it approved. And that leads to your Care Connect Fire profile, uh, which leads to first of type testing. And after the feedback we had for the process from November to March, now we have built maintenance because this is an iterative approach. We're not going to do it once and say it's done. Uh, there's going to be feedback from first of type testing. Uh, there might be feedback later on. And we have built maintenance in the process where a core team can look into uh, what are the feedback we have got and we can amend the profiles. Do you want me to try and answer? Yeah, go ahead. It's a really good question. So this, this process has been trialing for the last, really effectively last three, four months. So what, what we want to be able to be in a position is actually get them used. And based on some of that feedback, we're going to drive a little bit more of the what's the next step. So before we run too far, you know, I'm not at all interested in profiling things if there's no first of type provided and people are going to implement them. So I don't think we've got that totally clear, but there will be a versioning process that will, that will build in. But let's just get them used. Let's get some feedback from the vendors. Init already we're getting some, you know, oh, you know, this might take more than we thought. You know, can we get the standard contract to deliver yet? 
we're getting all this chatter. We're going to stick to these profiles until someone actually puts them in use. And then I think we can build the rest around it. Otherwise, we're just, I don't know what people think. Otherwise, we're just going too far ahead of ourselves, building a process for which we actually haven't got it implemented. And, and, and that's going to use up people's times unnecessarily. Another quick question. Is there any kind of um, credence being applied to things like the Argonne project in the US? Is there kind of those kind of profiles being looked at in terms of what's happening right. in the case of that? So, again, on that note, um, Argonaut. How are we looking at Argonaut? Okay, so what we've, what we've done in, in the UK, clinical models exist in the way our clinicians think about care and information. They might be different in the US, and Argonaut was created with US vendors. We've got to be very careful that whilst we want to have international health exchange, and vendors are international, we also have our information models that we've got to take into account. So the rules that we've put into place are that unless there's an absolute need to remove something, we don't. Unless we have to constrain something, because like NHS number, we won't do that. We'll keep things as close as possible to the international version of FIRE, but there are going to be some differences. We haven't specifically looked at Argonaut. We've just actually looked at the international set. Thanks, Amit. So just a list of vendors. Um, we have got engaged in the fire curation for primary care. We got EMIS vision and micro test. Um, you can guess the missing one. Um, then for secondary care, we have Cerner, Apic, DXC. Well, actually, last night I tried to find out what DXC stands for. I couldn't. Um, Stalis, uh, IMS Maxim, and Open EHR, and Ian is here. And he's part of the core team for, as a PRSP member. And from, from middlewares, we got um, Orion Health Intersystem and Healthcare Gateway. So what are the resources we completed? As Ahmed said, we did 14 resources. On the left is some admin resources like patient, practitioner, and encounter, practitioner role, which David already talked about. We did some clinical resources, which were needed both for transfer of care and GP Connect, which are meds, allergies, and condition and procedure. And the blue resources are highlighted because I'm going to use them in the coming slides in, in the examples. Um, David has already provided some introduction on composition. As you can imagine in transfer of care, we have four documents types, so we have used composition. And what composition allows us is to create sections on those documents uh, based on uh, the PRSP headings. For example, one of the sections is allergies and adverse reactions. One of the other sections might be medications. One of the other, other sections might be diagnosis. And composition allows us to structure the document like a clinical document. Um, allergy intolerance is a target resource to which we have in this example, which I'm going to give you uh, mapped uh, the allergies uh, and adverse reaction from PRSP. And the list resource um, is, is it allows us to create a list of anything, list of allergies, list of problems, list of procedures, a list of diagnosis, and it's a very good way in FIRE to really structure things, and, and, and we have decided to use that, and that, that is the, one of the design decisions. So let's, let's look at what is the clinical information model from, um, from which is, this is independent of FIRE. This was created by professional record standards body based on workshops with clinicians for discharge summaries and surveys. And according to them, a allergy in a patient should have a causative agent and a description of reaction and the severity and certainty and evidence. Um, keep in the mind fields like evidence, they are because they are quite rarely used they are in clinical practice, but they are in there as a, as a sake of completion. Now, that's the allergy intolerance resource from FIRE. As you can see, it has got its own set of properties like the type of allergy, the category, the criticality, and here is the curation ch challenge. PRSP information model, or the clinical information model, has got properties like evidence, which are not in FIRE. FIRE has multiple other properties which are not in the clinical information model. So as a, de so as a design team, we need to think about what we're going to do about it. If there is something in PRSP information model and it's not in FIRE, what do we do? Yes, we can create an extension. In some cases, this case we have decided that we'll create an extension for evidence. Um, in some cases, there are things in FIRE uh, which is not in PRSP information model, but we still need to decide how we're going to use it in the message. 
Um, in PRSV information model or the clinical information model, you might have value sets defined by clinicians. Sometimes they are defined to an extent. Sometimes they are set is nomad, but there's no value set. But when we are doing the firework, we actually have to give a proper value set. And, and, and there are situations, there are value sets in the clinical information models which are different from what's in the fire. So one of the examples is the type, allergy intolerance type. Fire is saying there are two types of allergies, allergies and intolerance. That's it. Um, and it's a required set, as David said. We can't change it. But the clinical information model said there are three types of allergies, allergies, intolerance, and adverse reaction. Right. What do we do with adverse reaction then? Um, because we can't change this. So this is where the mapping exercise comes in, where we look at the definition of fire intolerance. And this is all clinical work. It might sound fire is all technical, but technical people can't make that decision. They don't have the clinical insight to really un understand that what does it mean? What's the difference between intolerance and adverse reaction? And we spent hours talking about it. Clinically, can we define it? Can we actually you know, find it? it uh, any clinician can differentiate. And, and those are the discussions uh, we do get into. Um, we also issue a lot of implementation guidance back on, on back of that discussion, and that's going to design decision matrix for suppliers to use. And that is all documented, and you can see. So I will start, and I will give it to David, because David knows more about FIRE International. So basically, those value sets are owned by FIRE International, if they are required. And if we have to change them, uh, we generally have to go to them to say, because this is, as I say, version 3 of FIRE, there's a version 4 plan coming. And we can always go back to them to say, do you want to consider changing it? And there's all, already a um, lot of committees or work groups in HL7 International who are looking into all the setting the value sets. David? Yeah, so that, <coughs> that's actually pretty right. If the, I'm not going to ask the question, but if the, if the value set has got a required binding, then um, it, it cannot be changed. You can, there are things you can do with it. So, for example, you can um, say, I've got these two different things that actually are the same as this one, but they're more specialised. So you can do that. You kind of extend them upwards, if you like, map them upwards. You can't add, add new sort of ones at the top level. Every resource is owned by a committee and with an HL7, and that committee is the one that sort of indicates what the, uh, what the value set is in the specification. If it's not a required binding, then you can do whatever you like. Uh, and in that case, the governance then comes down to what governance you want to apply inside of the UK. Thanks, David. Um, so let's look at one of the examples and some of the design decisions we made in transfer of care. So as I described the composition resource here, which has got a section which says allergies and adverse reactions, which matches the clinical information model, and it says the causative agent, which is penicillin, which matches, again, the clinical information model. And within the composition, it allows a textual element, which is called a human readable part, which a clinician can see, which you can easily render or, or, or show it to a clinician, and that's what composition does, and that gives you that. And then comes the machine readable part. Machine can read and give the option to the clinician to import it, um, as David said, which is the aim we're trying to get in transfer of care. One of the design decisions we made in transfer of care was that we are going to only constrain to, to active allergies, because technically, in fire, you can send active allergies, you can send inactive allergies or resolved allergies. But what we said in a discharge summary scenario, all we are interested is in active allergies, and there's no need to send inactive or resolved. Because one of the other things was that the, the clinical model doesn't talk about the status at all. So we felt there was no need to have that inactive and resolved allergies in this, in this scenario. But that is not simple. Yes, you can carry allergies, but then we get into a discussion of how about negation? How are we going to carry no known allergies or, or no known drug allergies? And this is an example that, again, the section would say in tax, allergies and adverse reaction, no known drug allergies. And the list resource, allergy intolerance, would have a SNOMED code to say no known drug allergies. And we have provided that SNOMED code. And these are all design decisions because we work with terminologists to say we want a code for that. And they work with us to give that list. And this also looks into, as I said, the implementation guidance which PRSP gave on this. 
um, was that when you're recording allergies, send us a text as no known drug allergies and adverse reactions. But when we looked at the SNOMAD, there were three different codes. There was no known drug allergy, no known allergy, and no known food allergy. So if the SNOMAD code is no known food allergy, there's no point saying in the text that no known drug allergies, that doesn't clinically work. So one of the implementation guidance we are given is that what's in the text must match what's in the code, and that's clinically safe. And, and I think that's another example where we're looking with the terminologies, with the technical people, with the clinician, with the clinical safety to get the right decisions uh, to get into the specification. So I have talked about the DDM, Design Decision Matrix, is a spreadsheet in which we capture all the design decisions, the fire extensions, as I talked about, the decisions on restrictions on, on the value sets. Um, and we have um, not only value set of SNOMED CT, sometimes we use value sets from fire, um, and we provide implementation guidance. And as I have given you examples, sometimes we go back to the professional record centers bodies to that you need to change the clinical information model. We need to change the implementation guidance. So that's an example of a design decision matrix. So in line with the example, there you got allergies and adverse reactions as the PRSP heading. Then you got a causative agent. And there is a PRSP description, which is again a clinical description. So it can be agent in food. And then there is a fire target for allergy intolerance dot code, and this is, helps the technical guys to profile the fire um, resource because we're giving them the target working with the team. And then in the notes, you've got the value sets, which says it can be from the product hierarchy, from SNOMAD, um, and from the substance, and then we have some degrade codes and some implementation guidance. This is the published Care Connect profile. So this is just to note that the curation process finishes there. We've done our bit. We've done the DDM, design decision matrix. We have given implementation guidance. We've done the mapping. And then we hand over to the messaging team who actually do the uplift of allergy intolerance resource and publish it on a server. And that's the stage two. So this is the allergy intolerance uh, resource published in SDU3. And these published profiles are used then by the team to create a stage three in which actual API or a message specification is created. For example, for a discharge summary, there'll be a bundle in which there'll be composition, list, allergies, medication, dying condition, and all those. And that kind of compiling is done as a stage three by the messaging team as well. So stage one, fire curation. Stage two, uplift them to the server. Stage three, create API or message specifications. So we finished transfer of care and GP Connect uh, in four months, or four and a half months, which was quite an achievement because doing so many profiles in such a short period, a um, lot of people were in shock because, first of all, we were doing it for the, for the first time, and actually a lot of people didn't believe we will get it, we'll get it there. But we did it. We did it in four and a half months. It was the first time. And then we went to the other programs, and we had other programs with NHS Digital, um, who wanted to work with us and, and take it to fire curation. And we did reasonable adjustments, uh, which is a national project in pilot at the moment to add some flags to the patients uh, for certain disability and the Disability Act um, so that some kind of adjustments can be applied to them. So that's, that's a national pilot, but expected to roll out uh, locally with our other, other suppliers as well. Now we move, and we did reasonable adjustments in three weeks. And, and, and this is the pace and the iteration is really helping people to engage with us. Uh, we're not taking months, we're taking weeks to get it delivered. Digital medicine, um, we are looking at pharmacy to GP workflows. We looked, looked at two kind of use cases. One is emergency supply and the second is vaccine administration. Uh, where, again, the information, uh, initially vaccine administration, the use case is flu vaccination going from pharmacist to GP. Um, and in fact, tomorrow I'm chairing a call on emergency supply introduction to talk about how, what, what is the core team proposal that emergency supply would work, and we're using medication dispense resource. Moving forward, we are looking at doing digital child health. We are co they are coming to us in June, and then we have pipeline of projects within NHS Digital, including maternity and pathology and other projects. These are some links 
Um, the, the first one is a lesson learned presentation, which we created um, based on the feedback we, the work we did in from November to March. And once we finished transfer of care and GP Connect, we actually went to all the stakeholders and said, did it work for you? How was the experience? How can we improve? And wh what are the positives? And what are the changes? And I think we got, the people were really generous. We really got a lot of positive feedback, but we got a lot of things about how to improve the process, which we have built into the new process now. And that presentation is available for you as a link. And we have full feedback results from the survey as well, if you're interested to see what people said. Um, and finally, uh, we, uh, we as a curation team, uh, we have been nominated by um, Amir to NHS Digital Recognition o Award. Um, so I think that's another achievement for the team uh, where we have really kind of achieved a lot in the last um, kind of four or five months. So in summary, um, this is a collaborative constructive process where we consult with all the stakeholders um, and a lot of participation from not only suppliers, technical, as I said, clinicians as well, which we, we are getting from PRSP. Um, and clinical safety has done a um, safety certificate for us. They were involved in the process from the whole for four and a half months, and we went to the clinical safety group, and, and they have given certificate to us to release uh, Transfer of Care and GP Connect. We are looking into transitioning the so-called project we started as an experiment, really, based on so much demand into a business as usual service. And final, the quote is not from me, it's from the survey, and I think it, it's, it, it really kind of brings it home that it's really essential, no one organization can do it, and it's just digital on its own can't do it. It's really under the umbrella of interopen, we're getting all these suppliers and all this participation in, and different organization working together, and that we are able to achieve all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So